Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the latest Asian Carp Canada webinar. My name is Rebecca Schroeder, and I work on the Asian Carp Project at the Invasive Species Centre. So this afternoon, we're joined by Lisa Jones, who's here to tell us about the recently released Binational Grass Carp Risk Assessment. Lisa Jones is a visiting fellow at Fisheries and Oceans Canada, and she's been working for the Asian Carp Program in the role of researcher and project manager of the Ecological Grass Carp Risk Assessment for the Great Lakes Basin. She has extensive experience in aquatic invasive species research with a master's and PhD from McGill University, where she studied factors influencing the ecology of zebra and quagga mussels. Following the webinar, We'll have a question period where we'll also be joined by Becky Cudmore, who is the Asian Carp Program Manager at Fisheries and Oceans Canada. So if you have any questions during the webinar, please type them in the question box, and Lisa and Becky will do their best to answer as many as possible. So thanks again for listening, and Lisa, I'll let you take over from here. Great, thank you for the introduction, Rebecca. And I would like to first welcome everyone and thank you all for taking the time to join in today. So today I'm going to be going over the main results from the Ecological Grass Carp Risk Assessment for the Great Lakes Basin that was just finalized and released in January. So instead of waiting until the end of the webinar, I thought I would start by highlighting some of the main take home messages from the risk assessment. So first of all, we conclude that grass carp has arrived to the Great Lakes Basin, specifically sterile and fertile grass carp to Lakes Michigan and Erie, and fertile grass carp to Lake Ontario, and the invasion process has begun. And that the most likely point of direct uh, arrival for sterile and fertile grass carp to Lakes Michigan and Erie is um, through the, or sorry, to Lakes Michigan, is through the Chicago area waterway system. We also conclude that there are suitable thermal, food, and spawning conditions in the Great Lakes Basin, which would en enable survival and establishment. And that establishment through modeling results requires few fertile individuals if older age classes are introduced. We also find based on modeling results that once present in the basin, grass carp are expected to spread to other Great Lakes within five to 10 years. And when it comes to ecological consequences, the direct effect will primarily be through the consumption of submerged aquatic vegetation, shortened here to SAV, by grass carp, which may lead to negative consequences for fishes and birds in the Great Lakes. And finally, we identify that immediate preventative action will be most effective, especially in conjunction with management activities where grass carp has arrived. So these are some of the main take home points for the risk assessment. And so for the rest of this presentation, what I'm going to do is walk you through the nuts and bolts of the risk assessment to highlight how we come to these conclusions along with some of the other uh, key findings from the risk assessment. So for this webinar, I'll first provide a brief introduction to the risk assessment, looking at the background and purpose, scope and process, and then I'll take you through the main results for each of the elements of the risk assessment process. So that will be for the likelihood of arrival, survival, establishment, spread, ecological consequences, as well as what the overall risk will look like. And then we'll finish with a few concluding points. So for the um, introduction to the risk assessment, just as a quick refresher on the species of interest here, the grass carp. The grass carp is one of four Asian carp species that are of concern for the Great Lakes Basin. The other three are the silver, big head, and black carp. We completed a risk assessment for the silver and big head in 2011. And since then, the need for a grass carp risk assessment was identified. And also there is an ongoing um, grass, um, black carp risk assessment that is currently underway. These species were all brought from Asia to North America in the 60s and 70s, and have since migrated through US waterways towards the Great Lakes Basin. So grass carp is a herbivorous freshwater fish species that has been extensively introduced worldwide, including to North America where it was primarily brought in for the control of aquatic vegetation. And following its importation, offspring of these imports are thought to have escaped into the open waters of Arkansas around 1966. 
And then by the early 70s, the records of grass carp occurrence in the wild really started to increase in frequency in rivers in several U.S. states. And since its introduction, grass carp has continued to spread through various pack, uh, vectors and pathways. Its first captures recorded in the Great Lakes Basin in Lake Erie in the 80s, and was first observed in the Canadian waters in 1985 in Lake Erie, west of Point Pelee. Now, grass carp are known to consume large amounts of vegetation, which can change plant, invertebrate, and fish communities, as well as water quality. So there is a concern for what the potential ecological consequences may be for the Great Lakes, should they be introduced and become established. And this concern of grass carp introduction to the Great Lakes has been increasing over recent years, given the proximity to and occurrences of grass carp in the Great Lakes, along with the recent evidence of reproduction in southern Lake Erie tributaries. Furthermore, there is a high uncertainty and conflicting information when it comes to grass carp, which makes difficult management decisions more difficult. And in light of fiscal constraints, there's just a real need to prioritize activities and a need for direction for effective prevention, uh, monitoring and control actions based on a foundation of science. So following identification of this growing concern and need for science-based advice to prioritize these management activities, an ecological grass carp risk assessment was initiated by Fisheries and Oceans Canada through the Asian Carp Program, and it was coordinated by the Great Lakes Fishery Commission and in collaboration with the U.S. Geological Survey and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And the authors of the risk assessment are representatives from these federal agencies, with Becky Cudmore and myself from DFO, and Chapman from USGS, Um, Lisa, I think we lost you. So hopefully Lisa calls back um, quickly. She might have just lost her connection. I'm sorry, sorry, Rebecca. Yeah, where did I where did I fall off there? Um, just on the slide that you have up. Talking about the who was on the author team. Okay, sorry about that, everyone. I apologize. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> At least we got it back up and running. Okay, so the author team um, was uh, for Becky Cudmore and myself from DFO, Cindy Kohler and Dwayne Chapman from USGS. John Detmers from GLFC, Greg Conover from U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and Nick Mandrak from the University of Toronto. So the risk assessment was informed um, by contributions from individuals from federal, state, and provincial agencies in the Great Lakes Basin, as well as international academic institutions. And these contributions informed the scope of the risk assessment, the research carried out to inform the risk assessment, and the scientific peer review of it. So this input was used to set the scope of the risk assessment, of which there are three main aspects. The first is the ploidy. So the risk assessment addresses both ploides of grass carp. That is triploid, which is a sterile fish, and diploid, which is fertile fish. And the second aspect was a spatial scale of the risk assessment, and it addresses the connected Great Lakes Basin, which means that it includes the Great Lakes and its tributaries up to the first impassable barrier, which is shown here with the yellow and blue on the map. And it was assessed on a lake-by-lake -lake basis where appropriate. The third aspect was a temporal scale, and there was a need for short and long-term time horizons that was identified. So the risk assessment assesses risk at 5, 10, 20, and 50 years from the baseline year of 2014. 
So this brings us to the purpose of the project, which is to provide a binational science-based assessment of the current level of risk and its associated uncertainty to the Great Lakes and transfer that information to inform decisions around the management and prevention of grass cart. And this was done through a peer-reviewed risk assessment process, which incorporated existing and new research results on grass carp to evaluate the probability of occurrence, which you can see in this uh, left column here, which is based on um, the likelihood of arrival, survival, and spread for sterile grass carp, and the probability of introduction for fertile grass carp based on the likelihood of arrival, survival, establishment, and spread. Given that sterile grass carp are unable to form a self-sustaining reproducing population, we don't have the element of establishment included in the probability of occurrence as it is with the probability of introduction. And then for both sterile and fertile grass carp, we also look at the magnitude of ecological consequences, which is accessed at a lake-wide scale. And associated with each of the likelihood ranks um, for all the risk assessment elements and the consequence ratings is a measure of uncertainty. And finally, this is all then combined to produce an overall risk matrix. So for the probability of occurrence and introduction, we would rank each element using this likelihood scale with associated probability categories, which you can see here ranges from very unlikely to very likely at uh, 0, 0 to 0 0.05 and then 0.95 to 1. So for each lake and time period, we use this scale to assign a likelihood of arrival, survival, establishment, and spread, which I will be mentioning as we go through the key findings. You'll be hearing me um, refer to the different likelihoods for the different elements. And then for the ecological consequence ratings, you can see the scale here ranges from negligible to extreme. And these are all based on predicted decreases in submerged aquatic vegetation due to potential increasing grass carp density. So the ratings were evaluated separately for each lake based on the potential average grass carp density across the vegetated lake area, the vegetated area currently in the lake, and the recommended stocking densities to control submerged aquatic vegetation. And here we assume that submerged aquatic vegetation loss would be an ecosystem change that would capture all the other physical and ecological effects that may occur. So if change in uh, vegetation composition or loss was not detectable, the consequence would be rated as negligible, all the way up to extreme if you had a greater than 50% decrease in vegetation predicted, which is likely to occur when we have more than, uh, or when we have 15 grass carp per hectare. And then for each of these ranks and ratings, we have an associated certainty category. And this reflects the quality and quantity of data that was used to inform them. And here the scale ranges from very low certainty all the way up to very high certainty. And this really provides risk managers with an indication of the inherent strengths and weaknesses in the risk assessment. And then all of this is brought together into a matrix to provide a visual representation of the overall risk for sterile and fertile grass carp to the Great Lakes Basin. So the overall probability of occurrence or introduction is on the y-axis, and the associated ecological consequence is on the x-axis, with the ellipse size denoting, denoting the level of certainty of the data. So the larger the ellipse, the less certain we are. And this was done for each of the four years for each of the lakes at 5, 10, 20, and 50 years. And so you'll note here that the color in the risk matrix denotes a level of overall risk ranging from green at low to extreme in the red. Okay, so now that we have an understanding of the risk assessment process, I will now head into the main results for the risk assessment. And I'll go through the key findings by the elements of the process, and that is from arrival through survival, um, establishment, spread, and ecological consequences. And for each of these elements, I'll first give you a brief um, overview of the factors that were considered, some of the information that we used, and then what those key findings are. So we'll now start with the first element, the likelihood of arrival. Arrival was defined as the repeated um, detection of at least one grass carp 
in at least one part of the lake basin within any continuous five-year period. And it's important to keep in mind here that the likelihood of entering into one Great Lake from another Great Lake is not considered for arrival. Rather, this scenario is considered as spread. So for arrival, a number of potential pathways and vectors were identified and assessed where information was available. Those assessed include physical connections, this being canals and waterways and potential hydrological connections around the watershed, which included the Kaws and uh, Chicago area ponds. We also assessed uh, human-mediated release, which included bait use, as well as trade and stocking of private waters. And we also assessed the vector of lake or ballast water. And grass carp already captured within the basin were also used to inform the likelihood of arrival through these various vectors and pathways. So for arrival through physical connections, we considered a number of factors, uh, such as the information on grass carp captures close to and within the basin, um, the results of eDNA monitoring, state and provincial regulations regarding grass carp in and around the Great Lakes, and locations of grass carp producers and distributors. And from all of this physical, um, all of the physical connections assessed, the one that came out of greatest concern was the Chicago area waterway system. And this was for arrival to Lake Michigan. The cause provides a direct artificial connection between Lake Michigan and the Mississippi River Basin. And grass carp are abundant and established in the Illinois River. And furthermore, passage through the electric barriers in the cause is not a prerequisite to invade Lake Michigan. A substantial number of the grass carp are present in the cause between the electric barriers and Lake Michigan. So for example, between 2010 and 2014, 72 grass carp were collected above the barrier, including five fertile grass carp in or near Lake Calumet. Okay, so we also considered human-mediated release in the form of bait use, trade, and stocking of private water, which are all likely to be most important in the southern portion of the Great Lakes Basin, where these activities are uh, more prevalent. So for bait use, the likelihood of arrival will largely depend on several factors, some of which we have listed here, such as the characteristics of harvest activity in relation to grass carp source populations, and the ability to sort or cull grass carp from target catches. And it will also depend on the regulations in the Great Lakes. Most of these um, currently prohibit use of carp as bait fish, with Michigan and Ontario specifically prohibiting the use of Asian carps. So overall for this vector, the information um, is not well known, so there is very low certainty as to the likelihood of arrival via this vector. For trade and stocking, we considered information and regulations on grass carp being shipped and sold for stocking private waters and for food fish markets. And grass carp regulations among the eight Great Lakes states are varied and complicated by differing regulations for sterile fertile forms within several states. So for example, all Great Lakes states prohibit the release of fertile grass carp, yet possession regulations vary and it is legal to stock sterile, sterile grass carp by permit in Illinois, Indiana, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and New York. We also considered the locations of grass carp distributors and producers in the U.S. And while no producers were identified in Great Lakes State and no distributors were located in Michigan, Minnesota, or Wisconsin, there are multiple grass carp distributors in each of the five, lake, five Great Lakes states that allow stocking of sterile grass carp. We also considered information on the potential for contaminated stock of other farm-raised species such as feeder fish and channel catfish, as well as the potential for grass carp in aquarium and internet trade. Although uncommon as aquaria or water garden fish, we did find through the Great Lakes Commission web crawler that grass carp are available for purchase over the internet, but the extent of this pathway is unknown. So overall, there was very low um, or low certainty associated with trade and stocking information. So we also consider lake or ballast water as a potential vector for arrival. There is the potential for arrival through lake or ballast if grass carp establish in the St. Lawrence River, as ballast water and freighters that originate inside the Great Lakes St. Lawrence River Basin, known as lake or ballast, is not treated for aquatic invasive species. However, for this vector, we would be concerned with the small early life stages, so eggs, larvae, juveniles, 
and the probability for grass carp to be entrained as young as deer is quite low, as ports do not generally occur in nursery habitat. So given there are no known grass carp in or near the St. Lawrence River at the time of the risk assessment and the low, low, low likelihood of ballast uptake, this vector was ranked as very unlikely for both sterile and fertile grass carp. Okay, so overall, the key findings for overall arrival are that grass carp, both sterile and fertile, have arrived to Lakes Michigan and Erie, and fertile grass carp are considered to have arrived to Lake Ontario. And this is based on the definition used for arrival, which is the repeated detection of at least one grass carp in at least one part of the basin within that continuous five-year period. And the vector of pathway um, remains unknown for these. For Lake Superior and Huron, the invasion process is considered at pre-arrival for both sterile and fertile grass carp, and for Lake Ontario, it is considered a pre-arrival for sterile grass carp. Okay, so to get a likelihood for arrival for each lake, we combined the likelihood ranks of all of these vectors. So the ones we went through, the physical connections, human-mediated release, and lake or ballast, to come up with the likelihood of overall arrival. So for sterile grass carp, the likelihood of overall arrival to Lakes Michigan and Erie was ranked very likely with high certainty given the physical connection of the cause and stocking. And for the remaining lakes, the likelihood ranged very unlikely to moderate with very low certainty. And then for the key findings for overall arrival for fertile grass carp, Lake Michigan was ranked again as very likely with high certainty for overall arrival based on the physical connections through the call. And the likelihood of overall arrival for Lake Erie was ranked from moderate to high likelihood with moderate to low to very low certainty based on the bait and stocking factors. And the remaining lakes were ranked from very unlikely to moderate likelihood with very low to low certainty. Okay, so now we move on to the next element of the risk assessment, which is survival. And here we treat sterile and fertile grass carp the same, as there was not enough information to make a substantive comparison between the two. So the definition used uh, for survival was that individuals do not die upon arrival, and adults live through winter months in the Great Lakes Basin. And the likelihood of grass carp survival was based on several factors. This included the existing records of grass carp captures, the available scientific knowledge of biological requirements for grass carp, including thermal tolerance and food resources, and the availability of these conditions within the Great Lakes Basin. And we also considered the potential predation pressure and disease occurrence. So we'll start with a brief look at some information on existing records of capture. So live grass carp has been captured from all of the Great Lakes except Lake Superior, which provides evidence that grass carp do not die upon arrival and have been reported um, from the Great Lakes Basin since at least the early 1980s. Furthermore, analysis of recent captures of grass carp from Lake Erie indicate uh, that they have survived multiple years in the basin and were robust individuals ranging in age from one to 26 years with high body condition and in various states of maturity. So the collection of these larger, older fish is also evidence of long-term survival because most pathways of entry to the basin, for example, through bait buckets or through stocking, are limited to small fish of one or two years of age. Uh, although larger individuals, such as those captured in Lake Ontario, are more likely to have been released from live food trade prior to Canadian regulations for Asian carp. Okay, then we looked at information on thermal tolerance and food availability. And for thermal tolerance, we assessed the information from existing climatological models. All of these environmental niche models use slightly different data to train the models. They use different methods. But all methods, or, sorry, all models predicted either that the entire Great Lakes basin would be suitable for grass carp survival or at least its tributaries. And this is without anticipating future climate scenarios. However, it is important to note that it didn't take into account the exacting requirements for spawning and survival of early life history stages. 
Okay, and then for food availability, we considered the availability of plant material for adult grass farms. And modeling results here indicate that while the grazing as a whole are not dominated by such habitats, there are substantial areas with macrophytes that could be consumed by grass carp present in all of the Great Lakes. And further modeling results indicate that both Cladophora and macrophytes present in the Great Lakes would provide adequate food for survival. And that it is likely that juvenile grass carp will attain sufficient size for winter survival and be able to reach reproductive size using a variety of diets, including solely Cladophora. So we also consider predation pressure and disease occurrence. Grass carp are unlikely to be susceptible to most predators for very long relative to their lifespan, given that they have the really rapid growth rate. So any form of predation on adult grass carp in the Great Lakes would likely be limited to humans or large predatory birds. So overall, the primary impact of predators is most likely to occur on juvenile grass carp. As for disease occurrence, infectious diseases are not likely to limit survival, especially given the success of common carp and how fish species really tend to adapt in a few generations to these diseases. Two potential diseases uh, would be VHS and spring baremia. Although there's been no die-offs of grass carp that have occurred to date in North America, and neither um, has either been isolated from grass carp in North America. Okay, so this brings us to the key findings for survival. So we conclude that there is suitable habitat in all of the Great Lakes based on thermal matching, and that there is sufficient food available based on estimated macrophyte availability and consumption estimates. We also conclude that predation pressure is not likely to be a significant factor except for smaller sized individuals, and that there are no known significant diseases or pathogens that would prevent the survival of grass carp. So based on this information, we assess the likelihood of survival to be very likely with very high certainty for all lakes except for Lake Superior, which was ranked high with high certainty given the colder waters in this area. Okay, so this brings us to the next risk element, which is establishment. So establishment is the presence of a self-sustaining population which is defined here as having occurred when individuals spawned in the Great Lakes themselves then reproduce. And we note that the information on this element pertains only to fertile grass carp. This is given the inability of sterile grass carp to reproduce. So they were ranked very unlikely to establish uh, with high certainty. Okay, so some of the factors that we considered for establishment um, this is based on the availability of suitable spawning and nursery habitats. We also consider conditions for positive population growth based on modeling efforts. And we looked at the potential for survival of early life stages. So we'll go through a bit of information on each of these factors, starting with the availability of suitable spawning and nursery habitats. So several studies have been done that indicate there are numerous suitable spawning and nursery habitats for the Great Lakes. For example, we have Kohler et al. in 2007 that identified 22 suitable spawning tributaries in the Great Lakes Basin on the U.S. side. These are shown in the, the red circles here on the map. And this was based on um, unimpounded uh, river lengths from mouth to at least 100 kilometers upstream, which is thought to be um, necessary for Asian carp uh, spawning. And then another study examined eight U.S. tributaries in Lake Erie. And this is based on several spawning requirements. And here they found that seven of these tributaries could support spawning, including three larger ones, the Maumee, Sandusky, and Grand. In another recent study, suitable spawning conditions were found to exist in several Canadian Great Lakes tributaries, that is to Lakes Huron, Erie, and Ontario, as well as Superior. Although only one of the 12 tributaries actually had a mean annual total degree day that exceeded 2,685, which is what grass carp require to initiate spawning. So grass carp are unlikely to spawn in this northern range of Lake Superior based on this. And then based on a few other studies, we find that there are also extensive wetlands throughout the Great Lakes Basin and that many Canadian tributaries 
have both suitable spawning and nursery habitats together. Okay, so on to the conditions for positive population growth. So we had a life history stage structure model developed for grass carp for the risk assessment. And based on a thousand simulations of this model, it was estimated to be a 91% probability that grass carp would become established in the Great Lakes if introduced. And this was assuming no stochasticity and an age of maturity of four years. However, when we incorporated demographic stochasticity into the model, it was found that the predicted probability of establishment of a population 20 years after the introduction of zero-aged fish is really low unless a very large number is introduced. So, for example, you would need 40,000 individuals for 75% uh, chance of establishment. But, as you can see from the bottom graph, if older individuals are introduced, then far fewer fish are needed to establish. Furthermore, the ability of females to find suitable spawning rivers was also considered. And here we find that relatively low numbers of individuals are required, regardless of the probability uh, of spawning suitability. Okay, so this brings us to the survival of early life stages, which considers predation, food availability, and overwinter survival. So as for predation pressure, grass carp have rapid growth, so small individuals grow quickly and can escape predation pressure. So although growth may be slower in more northern regions of the Great Lakes, given the high fecundity of grass carp and that most native species must go through a similar predation prone period, it's unlikely that predation would prevent grass carp population growth and establishment. And food availability is not likely to be limiting given the success that they have had in other regions in the U.S. and that they have a similar diet uh, to other small fishes that survive in the Great Lakes. So we also consider the potential for overwinter survival of young of the year grass carp in, in the Great Lakes using daily water temperature series from the Great Lakes specific to southern and northern locations. So young of the year grass carp need to reach a critical link so that they have energy reserves to survive over winter. And this is dependent on the thermal regime during the growing season. And the model results revealed that with increasing latitude, young of the year grass carp need to be bigger to survive over winter and will suffer greater mortality. And that the average critical length of grass carp at onset of winter differed within and between lakes and over years with complete mortality in some locations. Yet despite the high fraction of cohort mortality in a given year across many locations, all the populations that initiated spawning exhibit, exhibited relatively high probabilities that at least one cohort out of a group of cohorts hatched across a 20 year period would survive in the Great Lakes. So while overwinter survival of young of the year varies with location, it's not likely to limit establishment except in more northern latitudes where it's less probable given the pattern of increasing overwinter mortality in northern regions. So overall key findings for establishment are that both suitable spawning and nursery habitat are present in the Great Lakes. Positive population growth would occur if they were introduced and requires few individuals if older age classes are introduced. There is no known impediment to egg larval and young of the year survival, although it is less probable for northern latitudes. And just as a reminder, sterile grass carp are not established in the Great Lakes given their inability to reproduce. So I'll first note that the likelihood of establishment at five years, here we considered the current state, which was as of 2014, and then for the years tw uh, 10, 20, and 50 years, the likelihood ranks considered the suitability of conditions for establishment. So the likelihood of establishment by five years is high for Lake Erie and very likely by 10 years based on recruitment evidence. And at five years, establishment for Lakes Michigan uh, and Ontario is low and is very unlikely for Lake Huron. But by 10 years, the likelihood of establishment is very likely for all three lakes. And the likelihood of establishment for Lake Superior remains low at 50 years with moderate certainty. Okay, so now we move on to spread. 
So Spread was defined as the movement of individuals or expanding populations into new areas within the basin. And this is between lakes, but not into the basin as this is a rival. And I will note here that while there are many differences between, maybe differences between sterile and fertile grass carp in movement, there wasn't enough information to make an informed comparison, so they are treated together here. However, you will note the likelihood ranks do differ based on the likelihood of uptake in ballast or bait fish. Okay, so spread we, was based on best available scientific information about natural dispersal, some information from natural dispersal models, and also considered information on movement through canals, lake or ballast, and human-mediated vectors, specifically bait fish introductions. Each of the Great Lakes was con considered separately, since the likelihood of spread um, through these vectors may differ among lakes. So we'll first look at the information on natural dispersal. So information here is quite limited, especially within Great Lakes type habitats. And most information is based on telemetry studies of fish in rivers and ponds, with highly variable movement rates ranging from a few hundred meters over four months up to 18 kilometers in four days. Furthermore, it's difficult to compare studies because of inconsistent tracking methods. And overall, there was a lack of information that really affected the level of certainty of rank uh, regarding natural dispersal. So we also consider results from a natural dispersal model. And this was an area-restricted random walk model that looked at two levels of movement, both of which were reflective of grass carp swimming speeds recorded in the literature and are labeled as slow and fast rate. And spread was modeled from two different arrival points from, um, for grass carp to the Great Lakes. The first one was with the cause to Lake Michigan and Maumee uh, for Lake Erie. And this was based on what the most likely point of arrival would be to the Great Lakes. So under the fast movement scenario for the cause release to Lake Michigan, after five years, some individuals would move to Lake Huron, and after 20 years, some would be expected to be in Lake Erie. And it was a little bit longer with a slow uh, scenario. So after seven years, some would make it to Lake Huron, and after 20 years to Lake St. Clair, and up to 50 years um, for Lake Erie. Then when we looked at the scenario for mommy release, so that's going into Lake Erie, under the, fun, the fast scenario, few individuals moved to Lake Ontario after five years, and some individuals into Lake St. Clair after 20 years. And under the slow, again, it takes a little bit longer, individuals looking to move to Lake Ontario after 10 years. And we'll note here that it's important to, uh, um, or important note here is that there is extensive presence of high quality wetlands is really important slowing spread down in both scenarios. So we also considered information on movement through canals. So first of all, we know that invasive fishes can spread through the Great Lakes through artificial connections, as we have examples of alewife and sea lamprey. But we also have two recent studies that looked at movement of tagged fishes, one through the lock and dam complex in the St. Mary's River, which is between Lake Superior and Huron, and the other through uh, the Welland Canal, which is between Lakes Erie and Ontario. And the results from these movement studies suggest that migratory fishes can move through the St. Mary's Lock and Dam complex, and thus movement between Superior and Huron basins is possible. However, there was no documented movement of fishes between Erie and Ontario through the Welland. Although fishes did move between the canal and each lake, very few moved through this light lock. So we also consider Laker ballast as a vector of spread. As you'll recall, Laker ballast isn't treated for AIS, and based on some modeling work that looked at the probability of a spread and establishment from domestic ballast water movement in the Great Lakes, we assess that the uptake and establishment probability of grass carp is low. So movement of grass carp between ports or lakes through Laker ballast is very unlikely. And then finally, we looked at human mediated dispersal. And here we are looking at um, the movement through bait fish. And while there's not a lot known on there, there was some recent research on uh, the potential for AIS to spread uh, via bait in Ontario. Um, they found that Lake Ontario was the most popular destination for Ontario anglers using live bait, and that most commercial bait fishes used would originate from waters of Lake Erie here on in Ontario. And these results indicate that the potential exists for grass carp to be dispersed by a bycatch and released if they remain undetected within the pathway. 
So this brings us to the key findings for spread. Based on the history of movement of fishes in the Great Lakes, fish can move from lake to lake. Movement is influenced by habitat and food availability, especially across Lake Michigan, Huron, and Erie. That movement to the second lake basin is expected within five to ten years. And that fish can pass freely across Erie, Huron, and Michigan. And movement between Huron and Superior is possible and less likely between Erie and Ontario. And that interlake ballast water transfer is an unlikely vector of spread, especially for sterile grass carp. So the likelihood of a spread of sterile grass carp to Lake Superior, Michigan, and it was ranked very unlikely given the lack of sterile grass carp in adjacent lakes. Lake Ontario increased from very unlikely to low at 20 years given the occurrence of sterile grass carp in Lake Erie. The spread of fertile grass carp to Lake Superior, Michigan, Erie, and Ontario is ranked very unlikely to moderate based on the spread results. Although the spread model predicts spread to Lake Ontario from Lake Erie within 10 years and fertile grass carp have been caught, the likelihood was not ranked any higher due to the likelihood of movement through the wellland. And then finally, the likelihood of spread of both sterile and fertile grass carp to Lake Huron was ranked higher given its proximity to the increasing occurrences of both sterile and fertile grass carp within Lake Erie and Lake Michigan, with sterile grass carp ranked high by 20 years and fertile grass carp uh, was ranked high by 10 years. So all of that was combined together to um, come up with the probability of occurrence for sterile grass carp. And I'll note here that it was very likely for Michigan and for Lake Erie. And then uh, the probability of occurrence increases over time uh, for some of the lakes in uh, Superior and in Huron and Ontario. And then we also have the probability of introduction. So this is combining the elements of arrival, uh, survival, spread, and establishment to come up with an overall probability of introduction for the fertile grass carp in each of the lakes. And again, we all know that for fertile grass carp, um, Lake Michigan is ranked very likely by 10 years and very likely for Lake Huron by 50 years. And for Lake Erie, the probability of introduction increases to high by 20 and Lake Ontario increases to moderate by 50 years, while we find that Lake Superior remains low at 50 years. So for ecological consequences, we considered vegetation, fishes, and changes for birds, abiotic factors, and disease. So for vegetation, modeling results uh, predicted decreasing levels of vegetation as grass carp densities increase, but that complete elimination of uh, vegetation occurred in only a few areas. However, substantial reductions in peak vegetation did occur. And once you reach greater than 10 grass carp at 13.2 kilograms per hectare, the predicted impacts tend to increase substantially. As for impact for fishes, research identified that there are 136 Great Lake fishes that have habitat preferences overlapping with grass carp. And of these, 33 fishes may experience high negative consequences, with 85% of them may experience consequences across all life stages, such as largemouth bass and northern pike. And a further 33 of these fishes may experience moderate negative consequences, such as walleye and suckers. As for birds, 47 water birds along the Canadian portion of the Great Lakes were identified that nest or feed in um, wetlands that could be affected by grass carp. And of these, 18 uh, species may experience high negative consequences, such as the canvasback or sora. And a further 29 species may experience moderate negative impact, such as the mallard and belted kingfisher. So as for disease, there is little concern on the potential impact associated with grass carp as those are in the U.S. and on certified farms don't represent a risk of introducing non-native pathogens and they don't represent any further threat to the Great Lakes than movements of other wild saprinids. However, additional import of grass carp into the U.S. could introduce non-native pathogens with unknown potential consequences. So just as a reminder, the ratings are based on the predicted decreases in submerged aquatic vegetation and the potential grass carp densities in each Great Lake. And consequences um, to other aspects of the community are assumed to be captured by the loss of uh, vegetation. And that individual sterile and fertile grass carp were treated the same um, uh, individually, although the sterile grass carp uh, are not likely to have as great an impact as uh, impacts are limited to their lifespan. 
So overall, magnitude of ecological consequences of sterile grass carbon in the Great Lakes was rated as negligible with moderate certainty for all years, which was based on current densities having had no detectable effect, the low likelihood of influx of sterile grass carb over time because of distance from uh, stocking facilities, and the limitation of consequences to an individual's lifespan. So even if uh, substantial numbers of sterile grass carp were released, threshold values for ecological consequences wouldn't be passed and consequences would remain negligible at the lake-wide scale. Then for fertile grass carp, um, so for all uh, lakes at five years, the consequence rating is negligible um, as current grass carp densities are below any threshold required for detectable impact. The consequence ratings then increase over time given the potential for growing population sizes. So we have increasingly higher ratings given from Michigan, Erie, Erie, Huron, and Ontario, reaching extreme by 50 years. And for Lake Superior, ratings remain negligible for all years, given the current status of grass carp occurrence in and around Lake Superior, and the certainty is low for all lakes and years. So finally, for overall risk, we recall that we bring the, all the information together from probability of occurrence and introduction on the y-axis, uh, then with ecological consequences on the x. And here we're looking at the overall risk for the probability of occurrence for sterile grass carp. And you'll um, recall that the probability of occurrence was very likely for Lakes Michigan and Erie, with arrival considered to have occurred in these two lakes. And the other lakes all increased slightly over time. But the ecological consequences remain negligible. So you see they're all on the left-hand side for all lakes and time periods as shown on the x-axis. And so overall risk remains low for all lakes at all time periods. So we're all in the green. Then for fertile grass carp, the overall risk is low at five years for all five lakes. They're all clustered down here. Then as the probability of introduction and ecological consequences increase over time, the overall risk increases to high for Lake Ontario and extreme for Lakes Michigan, Erie, and Huron by 50 years. And you see there that Superior remains at low overall risk down in the left-hand corner. So just a few conclusions from the overall risk. Lake Erie and Michigan are at greater risk relative to the other lakes. And if the rate of arrival increases, then the onset and magnitude of risk will also increase. And as ecological consequences are relative to the invasion processes, consequences will increase with abundance. So that brings me to just a few overall conclusions. First, as we've mentioned, grass carp has arrived to the Great Lakes Basin, specifically into Lakes Michigan and Erie for sterile and fertile grass carp and for fertile grass carp to Ontario and the invasion process has begun. Regulations and enforcement of regulations are two important factors that may affect the likelihood of arrival to the other lakes in the basin. And there is an expected time lag associated with the full ecological consequences of an established population of grass carp in the Great Lakes Basin. Therefore, immediate preventative actions would be most effective, especially in conjunction with management activities where grass carp has arrived to reduce the probability of establishment and delay or reduce uh, the subsequent ecological consequences may occur. So with that, it kind of brings us to the end of the um, presentation. And so I'd like to thank you for your time and welcome any questions that you may have that myself or Becky Cudmore, um, who's on the line, uh, will do our best to answer. And thank you. I'll hand it over to you, Rebecca. Thanks, Lisa. That was great. Um, so yeah, like she said, we do have time for some questions, and so far I am not seeing any, so I'll give everyone um, a second if you have any questions. Oh, we have one. Okay, so someone asked, can you comment on the probability of success of eradication efforts involving biobullets, advances in tracking and identifying nursery areas, etc.? Rebecca, it's Becky. Can you repeat that? I didn't quite catch that. Yeah, no problem. Um, the question is, can you comment on the probability of success of 
eradication efforts involving biobullets, advances in tracking and identifying nursery areas, and et cetera. I hate to sound ignorant, but I don't even know what biobullets are. I'm not sure what the I'm not sure if somebody can if they've submitted that, if they can clarify. It's a method of delivering um, a piscicide. So I'm not aware of that being done anywhere in the Great Lakes Basin. Okay, um, we can see if there's any other questions. Oh, it's um, the question, the person that asked the question said that USGS is developing these tools, but. Yeah, I just it, mentioned that we didn't assess uh, um, anything along that line for management actual activity. And I should point out that USGS is working on that for Big Head and Silver Carp. Okay, awesome. Um, so if there's any more questions, we can give it a second and see. OK, well, I think that's it. Oh, never mind. We have a couple more now. Could this be available in a printout form? Um, we will be posting the recorded version of this webinar on our website after, so I can answer that question on www.asiancarp.ca. And I'm not sure if Lisa could make her slide deck available. I'm not sure if that's something she would be able to do. Um, no, I think uh, having the webinar available online is good. Yeah, I agree. So yeah, we'll have um, the recorded version after. Um, posted after the webinar for you to go over again after. Um, another question is, oh, this isn't a question. It's a compliment the authors to the authors on an accessible webinar and level-headed presentation of the models. So thank you for that. And now we do have a question. How will the cuts to the Great Lakes Protection Plan impact the likelihood of establishment for all four species moving forward? So I don't, we don't know yet uh, what the what the cuts are going to look like and what that's going to be. But um, if there are cuts to uh, activities at the federal level, um, we can expect to see that trickle down. A lot of the work that's being done on grass carp are be is being done at the state level. So we're just going to have to wait and see what occurs in the next little while and what those cuts are going to look like. Um, is the finding of establishment based in some degree on whether agencies give up on control efforts? Which is another question we've gotten. Sorry, can you repeat that? Yeah. Yep. Is the finding of established based in some degree on whether agencies give up on control efforts? Finding of establishment? Um, okay. I'm not sure I, I quite thoroughly understand. So. The finding of establishment is based on activities being con predicted, being conducted at the 2014 level. If activities were different and were mitigating for reproduction and establishment, that, that would change what the outcome in the risk assessment would be. hope that answers it. Lisa, okay, does that um, align with what you were thinking? I'm not sure. I'm answering because I think Lisa's gone, gone back on mute again. No, I'm back on. Is, is my interpretation of that question your interpretation of the question? I think, it, well, my interpretation would be if there was an established population, is there no point in um, carrying on with mitigation efforts? And I would say no, because you can still reduce the abundance, which would, um, you know, is linked to the uh, level of impact. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, another question is, is the actual risk assessment available somewhere? Yes, there's like 11 documents. Um, <laughs> go to the Canadian Science Advisory Secretariat 
website in Search GrassCarp, uh, you'll find the risk assessment, the summary of the risk assessment, proceedings of the peer review, all the research documents that supported the risk assessment, they're all listed there uh, publicly available. Awesome. And then um, we have another question. Grass carp are reproducing in the Sandusky River, but agencies do not consider them established. That's the question. That's correct. Right. Awesome. Um, well, I think that's all the questions we have and all the time for questions that we have. So that was great. Thank you to Lisa and Becky for taking the time to speak to us about the risk assessment. And um, just a notice that Asian carp We'll be having another webinar on March 28th on modeling the potential effects of big head and silver carp on Great Lakes food webs. So stay tuned for registration information for that on our website at www.asiancarp.ca. And thanks again to everyone for listening, and we hope you have a great day.